Good morning, Third Reformed Church. It is so great to be joining you this morning. Uh, I'm hoping that we're able to have our outdoor service. So if you were just watching this at home because you couldn't or wouldn't make it to that, um, I'm glad to be with you. Uh, or if it's everybody and we ended up having to cancel because of the weather, uh, this may not be as beautiful as seeing you all face to face, but I am still here to bring you God's word. So before I do that, let's pray. God, you are so good, and we know you are so good because you teach us what good is. <clears throat> you define what good is. Everything you do, everything you ask of us, everything you cause to happen must be good because you are good. So help us to see that, help us to know that, to live that out, not to think differently, that you do not have our best interests at mind even when we can't wrap our heads around why you are allowing or causing things in our lives to happen. Help us to seek answers, help us to ask the right questions, and help us to live our lives how you want them to be lived. Amen. So today, our scripture comes from Luke 14. It is verses 25 all the way through the end of the chapter, chapter, which is verse 35. Now, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I've talked in past sermons and past opportunities I've got to preach to this congregation about my past. Um, the last sermon actually that was preached in this room to a full audience was me and part of my story and my references in that sermon were talking about my past. It's something that I think often about as I'm sure a lot of us do because it's what makes us who we are today. And I've talked about how when I was a kid I was a bit crazy. I had ADHD and just misbehaved a lot in school and with friends and in other opportunities, basically any that I got. I've also talked a little bit about the struggles I had as a teenager. I definitely talk about that with our youth group, um, just to connect with them and show them that even though I may be older and try to connect to them, that even though their parents may be older, we do understand some of the things that they are going through, whether they want to believe that or not. So today's story comes from those teenage years. Um, as I talked, said, I talked about some of the struggles I had. One of the things that I dealt with a lot when I was a teenager was girls. I liked girls, as many teenage boys do. And I let a lot of relationships and parts of my life compromise in pursuit of dating a girl or having a relationship or just getting one of them to notice me and spend some time with me. Um, I betrayed friends. I left family when I should have spent time with them, all in the pursuit of a number of girls throughout my life. 
One of those instances took place at a place called Sandy Pines. I got to preach there about a month ago. It was somewhere I grew up for 20 years. Um, we started having a place there in 2000, my family and I. And I had a buddy out there whose name was Charlie, and Charlie had a friend from school from Wyoming Park named Timmy, Timmy C. And Timmy was dating a girl at the time, and their relationship wasn't great as many teenage relationships are. We were about 14, 15 years old, so we didn't really have anything figured out other than, hmm, I like that person a little bit. So I said that about Timmy's girlfriend. I didn't know Timmy extremely well at the time. We were becoming friends, and we were getting closer. But when I met his girlfriend, I took a liking to her. Something I shouldn't have done. Something a friend, even a, an acquaintance, should not have done. But I did nonetheless. I talked to her behind Timmy's back, and after their relationship fell apart and crumbled and they broke up, me and her started a relationship. Now after that, that relationship also ended, as I said, teenagers. And me and Timmy became closer friends. Um, we, be, we were close friends for the next few years, but there were many more times in my life where I, like I said, I let relationships suffer so I could pursue girls. And I've done that in other ways, too. I've let roles that I have, like as a friend or as a boyfriend or as a son or a brother, suffer in the name of other ones, sometimes for good reasons and sometimes for bad. I've grown immensely since those days, and I've done a lot of repenting for my past treatment of my friends and girls and the times when I prom or compromise certain roles for my personal gain. And that's where I want to turn today, is to talk a little bit about that word, compromise. Now, compromise can feel a little bit like a dirty word, like something we don't like to hear. Um, it ultimately means that someone, and we fear us, or every party involved has to lose something. Even though a decision gets made, we all lose in compromise, just a little bit. It may be better for the group, but we are selfish at the end of the day. We compromise on one, two, we compromise on our roles, excuse me. Um, we compromise on certain ones on certain days. So on one day you may have the opportunity to be the best father and the best husband you can be. Your wife had a rough day at work or a rough day with the kids and your kids haven't played with you in the backyard in a while, and you have to choose which one of those directions you want to go in. Do you want to let your identity as a husband suffer to be the best father, or do you want your identity as a father suffer to be the best husband? And a lot of times, those things co overlap. Sometimes being the best husband is the best father, even if the kids don't see it, and vice versa. I've dealt with this recently, um, especially this week. I am engaged to my fiance Abigail. We're getting married this October. I am a seminary student, and I have a lot of coursework after a week off for the holiday this week. And I am a preacher this week. So I have these things going on and these roles that I'm trying to balance. I could just say, you know what, I just want to spend as much time with my fiance as I can, and I really do. I could just let my schoolwork suffer and let this sermon be worse than it could be and not complete so I could spend as much time with Abigail as possible. But I don't think me or Abigail would enjoy that. My professor certainly wouldn't and this congregation would not either. So I compromise to be a better student one day than maybe a pastor or to be a better preacher today than I was a fiance. And not saying I was a bad version of either of those roles. And that's often where we land. We aren't a bad version of that role, but we lean more heavily into one than the other. And every day we can see this compromise having to happen. Some people have had to compromise their jobs recently to spend time working for social justice. Very, very admirably so. We often have to let our family roles suffer and compromise to be the best brother or best son or best father or best husband, like I said earlier. Hindsight is 2020, though. And sometimes we can look back and say, man, I shouldn't have compromised there when I should have compromised elsewhere. 
I should have been the best at this when I tried to be the best at that and things fell apart. And we can do that and make it better for the next time we try. Now, one role I haven't talked about today is our role as Christians. Probably the last four times I've preached, so like I said, I preached at Sandy Pines. March, I preached uh, here, and earlier in the year, I preached at my home church at Forest Grove. And each of those sermons was about our identity as Christians, and this is, again, about that. Because to me, and it should be to all of us, the most important role in our lives is to be a follower of God. And that's where we get our scripture from today. It's a confusing scripture if you look on the surface, but when you dive deep into it, you see what the true meanings are behind it. So Jesus tells the people following him, not just the 12 disciples, but the crowds that started to gather around him, the people that started to see him do miracles and started following him in their cities but beyond that. And he says to all of them, these people that are kind of following him on a whim, giving up as little as possible, like I said, not even leaving their own cities sometimes so they can follow him. And he says to them this line about hate. Hate your father and mother. Hate your brother and sister. Hate your sons and daughters. Hate your husbands and wives. And even hate your own life. Every relationship that you hold dear, every role you have, you must hate in compromise to follow me. And we could look at that and say, this is really contradictory to what the Bible has said before. We're told to love our families, to be a good husband and wife, to respect our father and mother, to honor our children, to do all these things. And the thing is, that is true. And this passage, if we read it just in the English, the word hate sticks out to us. But in the Semitic, Semitic way of understanding it, how Jesus would have talked about it, it wasn't necessarily, or at all, I should say, actively seeking to do wrong to people being nasty to people, actively hating someone. It was more so just turning your back or loving less. Turning your back on these roles to follow God. If one is pulling you away from your journey as a disciple of God, you must act as if you hate that role at whatever relationship it may be in the face of following God. Excuse me for the pause. <laughs> We're even taught to hate our own lives, and we know that God talks about suicide as something that is wrong. We are, but he says we are meant to carry our cross, which means, as Jesus literally did, something that we never will in this day and age carry his cross, we are supposed to make that trek up to Calvary knowing that our life is at stake, knowing that our reprieve and our saving won't come as so many Christians in history have done before, we are meant to be willing to lay down our life to be a better follower of Jesus Christ. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that in all parts of the world, especially a place like America anymore. But we still have to be willing to make that sacrifice and make that ultimate compromise. So let your other roles fall away and compromise. But your role as a father of God shall never be put to the side. And luckily, being a follower of God, like I said, makes us do those other things. To be a follower of God, we are meant to be a good husband and father and brother and sister in all these roles, to be a good friend, to love others, to seek justice, to do things that we should, that the Bible tells us to, but the motivation doesn't come from those things in and of themselves. It comes from our identity as a follower of Christ. In my mind, one of the biggest places, especially in today's culture, where we allow our role as a Christian to compromise is in the political sphere and political climate that the U.S. has been going through for, you could say four years, you could say ten, but you just could say it's history. The political climate that we know is volatile, it is nasty, it is rude, it is angry, it is charged with racism, sexism, and all types of isms on all sides in some place. I have seen enough Facebook comments, I have seen and heard enough arguments, and I've listened to enough political podcasts and talk shows to know that today's political climate in America scares the heck out of me. But, like I said, I do see people 
letting their identity as a Christian compromise in order to become a part of one of the political parties and groups and ideologies and belief systems and positions. Not saying we should abstain from politics. I understand there's a responsibility that we have to seek justice, to love mercy, to work for a better future for those who will come after us. These things are in the Bible. And we do not need to compromise our role in politics because it is a role as a Christian to fight for those things. What I am saying, though, is that it breaks my heart when we have child care at this church and there are seven, eight, nine, ten-year-olds talking about members of office that they hate and wouldn't mind seeing die. It's been said before, as shocking as that may seem. It breaks my heart to see a movement like ACAB that takes a profession of people, a generalized stereotype that we've seen played out literally in our recent history, and demonizing them and then seeing Christians join their voices to those calls to look down upon an entire group of people whose actions don't speak for the others in that group. And it breaks my heart to see families torn apart because of outdated laws or belief systems and corrupt individuals when God would never stand for such a system that we have supported and promoted and been a part of in America. If every one of your political beliefs is not compatible with the Bible or promoted in Scripture, then you should not hold those beliefs. The only measuring stick in our lives is this book right here. It is the ultimate measuring stick. It should act as a fine mesh sieve for every single piece of who we are. It is the one part of our lives as an identity as a follower of God that should never compromise. We should hate those things that Jesus mentions in comparison to following him. And I would add our political and party identity to that list. Like I said, oftentimes politics does, and the belief systems and positions we hold, do align with this. It is not an abstinence from being a part of this thing. We as Christians should not say, well, separation of church and state, I just need to stay out of this forever. I'll never vote again, I'll never hold a position, and I will never give money to any candidate ever. I am not calling for that, and I do not think that would be responsible. I often think that a lot of things, everything that is a position in today's current climate can be found in here, and we should look for it. And if you can't find it, talk to someone because you're just not looking in the right spots. Everything, even if it was a different method back in those days as it is now, is spoken to in this Bible. And if you think there are issues today that don't show up in this, or don't have a Christian response to them, we need to take a deeper look at how we think of those things. But the one thing I can't do, and none of us should be able to do, is to let our role as a disciple compromise just to get an answer or be part of a group. And don't think for a second that this is easy. If it was, I wouldn't be preaching this sermon, and I wouldn't be just a little bit scared of the response I might get from it, and the security that my job has. Um, but Jesus says this in the passage. He gives two quick metaphors after talking about this compromising roles. And he talks about a general at war and someone building a tower. And he says that we must think of this deeply. This is what he says to the crowds following him on a whim. We must be brought down to our knees, deciding if this is the future for our lives and the role that we need to be a part of. And we need to give more effort and time and passion and thought to whether we are fully ready to be a Christian, to follow God and to compromise on everything else more than any other part of our lives. This thing, if you're watching this and say you're a Christian, if you come to church on Sunday morning if we have outdoor service and say you are a Christian, if at any point in your life you say you are a follower of God, it is not easy to do so, and it should not feel like you can do so on a whim. I understand the miraculous and instant power of the Holy Spirit, but there is a time for discernment in what this life looks like, because it is not always fun. 
It's, it's rarely fun to sit and have to deal with these feelings that well up inside us. But we have abundant grace, more than we could ever imagine, more than we could ever ask for, more than we could ever think should be given to us who don't deserve it. Because it is possible to be a follower of God. As hard as it can be, as terrible as it can seem to compromise on these other things, as much as our human nature wants to run away from it, it is possible with the power of God and the Holy Spirit and our Savior Jesus Christ as part of our lives. That's when it comes easy, when we set those things as the core of what we are doing. So I talked about Timmy earlier, my friend Timmy C. In 2012, uh, and May, I think May 20th, May 21st, Timmy was killed in a car accident. He was leaving a party. Um, he was 17 years old in an 18-year-old's car with a couple other people. And they were all had been drinking that night. And the driver uh, flipped, I believe, over a barrier on an on or off ramp. And Timmy and another student of Wyoming Park were killed in that accident. A couple weeks before that happened, Timmy reached out to me often. He was texting me, and I was at a point in my life where I was getting on the right step with my faith and my relationships with others. And as I said, kind of alluded to earlier, but me and Timmy and Charlie's relationships were, there were very many bad parts of those. Um, we were drinking, we were doing other things that we shouldn't have been doing, and I tried to push myself away from them, and I did not respond to Timmy's calls. I was not a good friend to Timmy. And then a couple weeks later, as I said, it comes on the news and I get a text on my way to work at the aquatic center from a friend saying that he passed away. I compromised on my role as a friend to Timmy. Not in light of being a better Christian, not in light of being a better boyfriend or son or whatever role I could have been playing. But I compromised in the wrong way. And, and there were drastic, drastic, drastic consequences, consequences for that. I don't blame myself for what happened, but I often think if, man, if, if I would have been hanging out with him that night, and we wouldn't have, he wouldn't have gone to that party, would it have been different? I wasn't the closest to Timmy. I wasn't his last hope at a, that not happening that weekend. Um, but it's something that stresses me out often. It's something that sticks with me even to this day. But it is so much worse for us to compromise on our role as a Christian. It is so much worse for us to compromise on what we can be for this world. As I said, I compromised on my role as a friend to Timmy. I also compromised on my role as a Christian to Timmy. I was not acting as God wanted me to. I was ignoring someone crying out for help. I was putting down and looking the other way and turning my back on someone who needed someone else in his life. He needed a friend. He needed someone to talk to him. And as much as he wasn't at the end of his rope at that time in his life, I compromised on my identity as a Christian. And it's something that is hard for me to live down. But the good thing about all of this, and the good thing about us carrying our cross, is that we are never alone in that fight. Simon the Serene, helped Jesus carry his cross. He was removed by a Roman guard in trying to do that, and Jesus was left alone again. But in our lives, we, have, we are surrounded by so many people that can help us carry our crosses, to respond to a text, to spend a Friday night with each other, to do something different than what this society tells us is important and what we shouldn't compromise on when we know that what we shouldn't compromise on is our identity as a Christian in this book right here. And we need others to help us with that. So I implore all of you to lend a hand, to help others look deeper into themselves, look at their priorities, look at their roles, look at their compromising. I implore all of us to come alongside each other in this thing that is so hard as our faith and our role and our identity as a follower of God because it is, at the end of the day, all that should matter to us. So I thank you for sticking with me through this. Um, 
As I said, it's a tough thing to talk about, especially as a 26-year-old youth pastor talking to a camera. Um, yeah, it is a tough subject to try to tear down some of the unstable and emotionally immature parts of our lives in order to be better followers of God. But I, I am glad that you joined me for this sermon. There are questions and discussion questions in the in-home worship guide where if you're watching this on YouTube, you can find in the description of this video or they have gotten emailed to you already um, from an email yesterday from, I believe, the church account. I really encourage you to dive into those because, as I said, we need to come together and discuss these things in groups and families and in friendships to really get to the meat some of these issues. Um, as I said, I hope we have outdoor service today as you're watching this. Um, if we don't, we will be rescheduling again and trying to look at future dates to make those things accomplishable. Um, and in the meantime, please just interact with us. Put some comments in the comment section. This is posted on Facebook. Comment on there. The church is open for individual meetings if some of these things stir up emotions in you and stress in you and questions in your life where you can talk to one of us on staff to set up a one-on-one -on -one time with. There are options where we can still remain connected without being able to be, to compromise on our health, our safety, and the guidelines that are before us. So again, thank you for this. Thank you for engaging with this. And therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord you are God. Your labor is not in vain. Amen.